Assalamu uh, alaikum. Welcome back again to English uh, Poetry. Last time we uh, defined poetry. I gave you the chance to express your own uh, thoughts about what you think poetry is. We also examined uh, 12 famous English uh, definitions of, of, of poetry. Today we will study our first official poem for the course. And I know this is an English uh, uh, poetry course, but I always like to give my courses comparatively in a comparative sense so we can understand how different cultures, uh, different poets, different ages do probably the same uh, uh, thing more or less. So the first poem is by a Palestinian poet, Palestinian young uh, poet and icon actually. His name is Tamim Barouti. Probably you, you are all familiar with uh, Tamim Barouti's work. But before we go to Tamim al barghouti I want to ask you uh, again to tell me what definitions you remember from last time. Okay, remember the 12 definitions. So which one do you still remember? Which one do you, do you cherish? Which one do you consider to be probably the definition closest to your heart? Mara. Poetry is a criticism of life. That's one of the most powerful modern definitions. And usually think, I gave you this question to think of how the definition could possibly reflect the age, the time. If I say poetry is criticism of life and I compare it to the neoclassicist definition of poetry teaching and delighting, how how are they related or not? Yeah. Uh, the poetry is to take life by the throat. Poetry is to take life by the throat. Does this indicate violence? What do you think? Like, because of course, this is a metaphorical definition. Yeah. Defining a language heavily based on metaphors, using metaphors, is not sometimes the, the wisest thing to do. But I, I think this is deliberately done. So what, do, what, what would you understand? I know some of you objected to this. And some of you love this, by the way. So what does it indicate, like taking life by the throat? Of course, metaphorically. Please. I think that means that you talk about anything that makes you um, feel that you want to make it out. Mm -hmm. If you have a feeling of anger or, or of sad or, or anything, of Cthulhu, so you want to get this feeling out so you can use it. OK, thank you. He or she. Okay. So it, the moment comes when he or she, the poet, does what? Like he uh, feels his feeling of being patient. That's enough. Okay. Thank you very much. The feeling of having had enough and finding a way to release this through poetry that could be part of it. Uh -huh. so this is something that maybe like you cannot control your life in real life, so you, you refuse to focus. Trying to make sense out of the mess around us, the chaos. Because, yeah, this is an act of violence, holding somebody, don't do this. But it's also an act of controlling the object, whatever you're dealing with. And life is uncontrollable. So if in poetry you try to release, you've ha you, you have had enough, and you try to make sense out of the environment out of life, probably this is some kind of controlling life. Another definition, please. Okay. Are you sure this is Wordsworth, not someone else's? Okay, say it again. What, what's the definition again? Thank you very much. Please don't forget the second half of word, uh, Wordsworth's uh, definition. Yes, I like it because I think that poetry is a purely experienced, personal experience that does not, doesn't have to teach him the teaching of poetry. Uh, it's a very personal experience of personal feelings that the, the poet feels and expresses. Okay, different schools have different opinions. You, see, you, you seem to believe in the, the romantic 
definition of poetry more than any other uh, definition. One more, please. The rhythmical creation of, uh, of poetry. The rhythmical creation yes, of, beauty. of beauty. Turning beauty, the abstract thing, into, into music. Into, uh, still, music yeah. is still abstract, but it's more probably concrete, uh, concrete wind rendered in poetry. One more. Poetry is painting. Poetry is is painting. But we don't use paints in poetry. But again, when we talk about imagery and images in poetry, the image is an imagery. In poetry, an image is something you can feel, touch, hear, or smell. So there is imagery in poetry that is similar to the colors and the shapes we do in, in when painting. One more. And you like this. But did you have a chat with Rahaf about how good or bad this definition is? We had a chat that we both agreed that William Wordsworth's definition is better. OK. I agree that. So it's in the fight. Ah, so you, you, you couldn't come to compromise about this? No. OK. Well, finally, please, somebody, yeah? OK, so you, you like the definition that highlights the fact that poetry is different from prose because there is rhythm, there is music there. It, well, this is what basically makes it, because in rhyme, sometimes we don't have rhyme in poetry. We don't have at least a regular rhyme in poetry. There's blank verse, there's free verse. But sometimes, uh, and sometimes again, we have musical prose. But the fact that you're emphasizing the, the music aspect here of poetry, that tells how, I'm not sure how, if you want to compare poetry personally with prose, which one you, you would be preferring here? What do you think? Poetry or prose? Which one uh, do you like reading more? Are you sure? OK, nice. So I tried to summarize, just to remind you, that to choose five out of, just probably basically randomly done here. But yeah, I agree that. This is significant because with Sydney and the neoclassicists teaching and delighting being a reason behind poetry and literature that remained for more than a thousand years. Many people still believe today that the first purpose of writing, of poetry, of literature is to teach and delight. And then we come to your uh, favorite definition, uh, the spontaneous overflow of powerful emotions recollected in tranquility, the romantic definition of, of poetry. I know most of you like this, no offense to you. But we are at a time here, at, a, at an age where, yeah, yeah, overflow of emotions. I'm not sure at the end of this course, or in two years, five years, 15 years, whether you believe uh, literature to be, or poetry to be, not only an act of taking life by, by, by the throat, but an act of, I don't know, shooting life right between the eyes, <laughs> and as an act of uh, protest. And then, Familiarizing and familiarizing, defamiliarizing things. Criticism of life, poetry is a way of taking life by the throat that you just <coughs> mentioned. And then last time we ended the class with very significant uh, uh, points here. When you comment on poetry, criticize poetry, there are many ways to do it. But because you don't usually do it in an organized way, yeah, like academically, because this is you doing <coughs> academic courses here. Sometimes you miss many points when you answer a question or talk about a point. All I want you to do is follow the, the, the academic logics here, where you go for the topic sentence, for example. When you say something, when you believe in something, when you see something in the text, go for the topic sentence, which has the topic and the controlling idea. And then many students do like jump from the topic sentence to the, to the examples. Don't do this or the evidence. I usually say, say something, say it again, in other words, and then give examples or an example or evidence. Meaning, if you believe that the poem has, uh, going back to Ali Abu Nama's poem, if you say, uh, I don't believe uh, Ali Abu Nama is, or the speaker in the poem is going to change. 
most of you will always say, like, I don't think that uh, the poet is going, the speaker is going to change because, <coughs> for example, try not to do this. Try to explain what you mean by the topic sentence, by, by the main idea here you have. So if you say uh, something in the first uh, sentence, when you open your paragraph, try to make it general. Uh, this is usually you making a judgment. I could differ uh, with you, I could agree with you, but that's not where I give or don't give marks. Please, always differ with people. Don't just follow people's ideas and opinions. So if you say, for example, the speaker in this poem uh, is not willing to change, or the, uh, the text shows here that the poet is not going to change. What do you mean by this? Explain it, say something about it. Say something to make it clearer. If the poet is expressing uh, regret, perhaps he's not going to be a different person later on after the poem. And then you go for, for example, and there are two types of evidence. Number one, textual evidence. Use the text itself, like the, the use of regrets as plural. Can be, this is evidence. The use of the past simple tenses. This is evidence. You tell me like in this word, in this phrase. I don't expect you to memorize the poems, by the way. But I expect you to know these like little words and phrases. And <laughs> so in the poem, the poet did this and that. He said this and that. She said this and that. Regrets as plural could be used as evidence to indicate that somebody is willing to change. I don't have just one regret. I have regrets. Regret, sorry. So the plurality here could be an indication that there is a willingness to change. Now the second type of evidence is based on thoughts, ideas. And again, I totally encourage you to express your opinions. But try to mix and vary here. In the same idea, in the same argument, try to use this and that to show that you are a critical human being. And again, going back to Ali Abu Nama's poem, you could say uh, the poet is willing to change. Basically, the very act of writing the poem is an expression of, of change. At least if he doesn't want to change, he wants other people to, uh, to change. Okay, this is what we did last time. Any question before we move to poem number one by our favorite poet, Palestinian poet Tamim al -Baruti. Please, someone. Go on. You said that the evidence based on ideas and thoughts. How could it be based on ideas? I mean, if I have an idea, I will prove it by the text, by the text and then prove it. Yeah, that, that's, that's a valid, a valid question. My, my idea is that, uh, like when I say thoughts, like how you feel about the poem, generally, like personally. I encourage, because some people, I know many people who say, no, anything you say about the poem has to be supported by textual evidence. Yes, but not always. So if you say that uh, the poem uh, here, the poet is, is trying to engage in, in a dialogue with somebody, show me where the dialogue is. Who is he dialoguing with? Okay? But you could say the poem is... Uh, is a protest against patriarchy. And the fact that this is a woman writing differently, let's say Emily Dickinson, the use of dashes, the sharp, uh, the short poems sometimes, the sharp images. I could maybe, this is where I could say, I don't see it. But you could still argue that this is, for example, a particular woman writing against a particular set of uh, beliefs. We'll see more with, with poems. Okay, so, yeah, finally we come to this poem that I believe most of you love very much. So remember the four steps we usually do. We look at the poem, right? We recite the poem, and then we try to understand the difficult meanings, the new meanings, the, 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 the phrases, the expressions. And number three, we try to understand the poeticality of the text, the literary devices, the metaphors, the, uh, the examine link between what we notice and what the poem or the poet says. 
So let's just look at the shape of the poem. Okay, this is stanza number one. And this is stanza number two. We usually don't see poems like this. They usually either follow this highly structured, highly organized form, or this formless, free verse, blank verse kind of writing. And this is stanza number three, four, etc., etc. Okay, so what do you notice, please? No, f f again, first stanza. How would you comment on this? How would you describe this uh, part of the poem? The same sounds, the okay. Rhythm. Even if you don't know Arabic, you could still guess that the sounds here, yeah, the, the last three the letters are the same. And probably not always. In, in Arabic, they do usually. But in English, don't be tricked by the, the letters. All we care about is the sounds. We've seen again in Ali Abraham's poem, there was I, there was cry, and there was sigh. But the sound is what we care about. And this is called the rhyme. Al-Qafiyah. The ending sound or sounds of a line of verse. The sound here is phonemically transcribed I. I. Despite the fact that the letters are totally not related. In Arabic here, we have suruha, tazuruha, duruha, yudiruha, sururuha, tudiruha. We call this a regular rhyme scheme. Not only a rhyme, because the, you will find a regular rhyme scheme. <coughs> That's good. So there is regularity here. What else? Please. Okay, I'll come back to this. I'm, again, my question always, my first question always is about noticing things without reading. Even if you don't read here, you still can guess that there, there's some kind of repetition in the I last sound. The poem, okay. like Thank you very much. If you do this, the poem is going to look like this beautiful box that we want you to think out of all the time. It's a block. What else do we notice about the shape and the form of the poem? Hmm. Please. Uh, um, each line is split into... Thank you very much. Each time is split in half. What do you call this? Thank you very much. Cesura. Cesura from Caesar, Caesarian. That's nice. All the lines are divided into two. All the lines end in the same three letters. Same sound. Now, we look at the poem as we read it. So somebody please read the first stanza. Okay, Mara. Could you speak up? Beautiful, one more. Yeah, please. I'm 
That's also beautiful. One more. I don't want you to uh, make mistakes in the drama. Thank you. Also excellent. So, does does the reading make a difference? The recitation, reading aloud, does it give you any sense? The musicality of it, you feel that it's it's actually the same meter again and again. I, I'm not sure what bahar this is. What you know, meter this is in Arabic. Probably mutafa'alun, mutafa'alun, fa'ulun, whatever. I have to check with some guy in the Arabic department. But we do the same, we do say the same thing. And it's like musical, musically speaking, we go up and down, up and down, up and down in, uh, in the same way in the six lines. So when we read this, we could add to the fact that, again, highly regular shape, regular rhyme scheme, the caesura in the middle, the gap, the pause, and then the music, the, this is what we call the rhythm, the music of the, the poetry. In Arabic, some people now say the rhythm, rhythm. It's the same, the rhythm. Okay, so what else do we notice again? About the language, about what he says, the vocabulary, the choice of words, and other things. Please. Again, it's a classical beginning in, in the meaning. Like, he, he talked about the love of the poem. Oh, yeah. It's not the basic uh, uh, subject of the poem. That, that's an excellent thing to notice. Mm -hmm. This is a poem written, I'm not sure how long ago, 15 years ago or so, 10 years ago. And the poet, I, in the other groups, I asked them to take the first line and to try to quiz the people around them, the people they know. Your mom, your friends, somebody in the taxi, uh, people studying uh, uh, something other than, you know, Arabic people who don't know, uh, Tamim maybe, not familiar with the poem. So probably you need to do, go look some under some rock here or there to find somebody who doesn't know this line. And ask them, can you guess who the poet is here? And please report to me. Tell me what they thought, what they think about the, the, the author, the poet behind this. My guess is that many people, or at least some people, will not recognize Tamim or will not relate this line to someone alive, contemporary poet. Because of the way, at least, number one, because of the way he begins. Classically, many uh, uh, like many Arab uh, poets started their poems, <coughs> opened their poems. In Arabic, we call it al-istihlal, yeah. to begin. In English, you said the opening, the beginning, <laughs> by beginning with, uh, passing by the home, the houses, the, of the beloved. And also standing over the ruins of a past, you know, tribe or something, connecting the present with the past. So, Marana ala dar al Habibi is a classical way of beginning uh, uh, poetry. The Arabs did this many, many, many times in the past. When we're talking about a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago. What else, in addition to this? What else do you notice? Hmm. Please. It's, it's filled with the same? The same What's that? No, the, the foot is different from the rhyme scheme. The same, we're not familiar with the meter here, but when we read it, it sounded the same. It's the same movement we do here. It can easily be sung, by the way. And that's why it's called lyrical poetry. Almost all poetry is lyrical because it can be sung. More about the words, the language. Yeah? Please? The language is basically simple, true. 
This is simple language. What is the most difficult word here? Yudiruhaya and darar, to harm something, to hurt something. Simple language, that's true. More. Please. Okay, so the, the, there are a lot of binaries here, the opposites. He used many words to mean the thing and its opposite. Like what? Like what, yeah? Al-liqa, well, where is the al-liqa? Okay, there is here talqa, and there is also? Where is it? Same line, what else? Tusar, thank you very much. Yudir, this is called binary opposites. Binary opposite. Al Firaq, Liqao. What else? Tubsata is the same. Al Habib, Al Aadi. Now we call this binary opposites. If you're studying mathematics, if you know mathematics, there's the zero and one opposites. And this is again a very important. Uh, place to start in a poem. Try to understand the opposites in the poem. Can we find more, more opposites other than these? I think you can. You, if you dig deeper, please. Habib al Adi. What else? More. Huh? Mar Excellent. Maralna, again, with the intention of being there, passing by to, to visit. And then we were sent back. Faraddan, true, more. Hmm. What else? Okay, go back to things you notice about the poem. Please. Okay, where's that? With him, Shh. Please. Respect your friend, yeah. Where's that? Okay, that's, that's also beautiful. Here, I, I'm not sure who he means here by Mararna. Probably the poet with friends and family or with other people going to visit Jerusalem. And again, but then the moment there is here hope of meeting somebody you like, going somewhere you love. And then the enemy occupier sends him, sends them back or at least at least it makes it difficult to be there. And then he probably talks to himself here. The dialogue is, an, this is an internal dialogue, but it is still a dialogue. فَقُلْتُ لِنَفْسِي He didn't speak to someone else, to anyone else, I don't know why. رُبَّمَا هِيَ نَعْمَةُ فَمَاذَا تَرَفِ الْقُنْسِحِينَ تَزُورُ That's a beautiful thing to notice. There is a dialogue. There is a dialogue. And again, this is the reply. He's still talking to himself, engaging in a dialogue with himself. More, please. I like the way at the, at the last one, uh, when, I like the meaning that when you... When if you, you say, say it's different from yeah. Yeah, yeah. because uh, we are the, the act. I, I like the way that when you, when you saw... Uh, the, or when you see the Jerusalem for the mist uh, for a uh, once time, you feel like uh, it's it, it will be uh, in your memory for for all uh, all of your uh, life. So, okay. Wherever you go, Wherever whenever you, you are, are, because this is again the power of imagination. This yeah. is the power of recollecting tran in, in tranquility. This is what's worth. This is a romantic concept. More. Okay, so there is us, people who come to visit, and also there are the enemies, the others, the others. Okay, please. Can you say like there is a synopsis and Tarah line? Because it's one eye. This is a, a, common, a common expression. Even in, in, in English, you'll find people using just one eye. In my mind's eye, Hamlet would say, for example. Oh, but possible, yeah. Like using one eye. Just to mean the two eyes. Um, I think the reason uh, is behind the using the classical way that first 
we're not talking about the reasons now. Let's wait. Let's just collect data, collect information. Let's see how things, you know, go. And then finally we come to the <coughs> possibly of, of a why question here. In the last two lines, con conditionality, there's, there's a condition here. If you see, if you see it, it won't be a guarantee, it, you'll be happy, it will please you. Whenever you see Jerusalem, if you see Jerusalem, if only once, even once, you'll see it wherever you go. That's true. If, please. Oh. I love this. No, wait. Don't jump. Like, and this is, again, uh, what I just said. That your problem is, ah, like, uh, he used different uh, tenses, uh, past simple, and then you jump. Why would you jump to the second point? Finish this. Make it clear. So, the tenses, when you study a poem, it's important to examine the tense or the tenses and the shift from one tense to the other. This is part of understanding the poem. So, here, this is past simple tense. This is Past simple tense. This is past. This is present. This is also present. This is present, present, past, present, 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 nice, past, present. No. Future. 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 Yes. Future. And to Dero is also present. present. Could be possibly connected with the future. And for so far, to So at a poem, a short stanza in a poem that includes three tenses. Past, a lot of past. And some present and also future. Okay, so look at what we did here. Number one, we noticed this, the form. And we concluded that the form is highly regular because of three things. Number one, the shape. It's, it looks like a box, a block. And then the way it ended, it ended in the same sound or sounds. We call this rhyme, a regular rhyme. And also we noticed the this is Yura, the break, the gap in the middle. By the way, old English poetry used to, to, to employ the same poetic technique, this device in the middle. But later on, they started using uh, uh, punctuation marks to create the Yura, the break. So that's number one. And then number two, we, when we read it, we felt that this, this is musical. This is poetry because of the way it reads when you recite it. And then we looked at the binaries, the opposites. We realize that there is Habib, Aadi, Ghiyab, Yalqa, Luqya, Tasur, Yudir. Are like basically three or four major binaries, opposites. And in the language itself, you, some, some, one of you said this is simple language. But I'm not sure if you paid attention to this. The vocabulary, the diction here, you know the word diction from dictionary? The language, the poetic diction here is also inspired by old Arabic poetry. Dar al Habib, al Adi, al Luqya, al Firaq, etc. The words, the vocabulary, if you take them out, you feel that the, this, these are. It doesn't mean we don't use them these days. But the way it sounds like an old Arabic, Arabic poet. And then, most, uh, and then most importantly, I think, the fact that it begins, it opens with a very famous Arabic, old Arabic way of, of, of starting poetry. Maranna ala dar al-habib. Antara bigul, ya dar ablata bil jawai takallami. Masbut. Qaisish bigul, amurru ala diyari diyari layla. Right? Qais bigul, أرى البين يشكوه المحب البين البعد فراق محبون كلهم فيا رب قرب دار كل حبيبين like the, the dar here the house the home of the people you love this has always been there 
in Arabic poetry. Okay, more before we move. Where are the questions? Okay, thank you very much. This is a question. What would you see in Jerusalem when you visit here or it? But this is not a question. This is not a question. This is conditional. This is the matter that means if or when. Whenever or. So there's one question here. Not, not more than one question. Now, the second part of the poem. See, what we do is that we try to notice things to build up a case to create patterns. To create a pattern or patterns. And then we move, for example here, we'll move to the second part to see if we find the same thing there. In order to try to answer your question here, Roseanne, why? Okay? Yalla, let's see. What do you think? If you're not familiar with the poem already, I could have asked you to, to tell me if this is part of the same poem or not. No. Many would say, it's not the same. They don't look the same. It doesn't fit. Please. Before that, again, remember, always go easy. Shape, what do you see? Is this as structured? As organized, as regular as the, as, as the first part? It's, it's irregular, but it has a pattern. It's the same thing. There could be a pattern. The thing with this, if you check uh, online resources, you'll find different websites using different uh, ways of uh, layout for the same poem. I saw websites going for making this one whole line, one whole line, because it's one thought, and going for a long line. في القدس باع وخضرة من جورجيا بريم بزوجته يفكر في قضاء إجازة أو في طلاء البيت. That's called spoken poetry or performance poetry. Spoken poetry. Uh, there is poetry that is meant to be delivered, performed by the poet himself or herself. It, it reads differently, totally differently. So number one, compared to the first part, this is. This is kind of irregular. Do we have the same sounds or letters repeated at the end? So possibly there is no rhyme, at least there's no rhyme, or there is an irregular rhyme scheme. What else? What else do you notice? Say again. There is a lot of repetition. Fil Quds, Fil Quds, Fil Quds. Fil Quds, Fil Quds, Fil Quds. That's like how many Fil Quds is? That's six of them. Hmm. More? Let's do the way we did with the first stanza. Uh -huh. There's no break in the middle of the lines. There is no break. Although, again, sometimes the, the comma or a, a punctuation mark could function as a caesura. It doesn't have to be physical space. But yeah, there is no break in the middle of the line. More. Different lengths. True. So probably different musical pattern, different rhythm, different meter maybe. More. Basically, thank you very much. No rhyme scheme. Whether you end it here, al-bayt, ahkamuha, ishreen, etc. Or, zawjatihi, baytu, ulya, ahkam, totally different. So there's no rhyme scheme. Please. Uh, a lot of prepositions. prepositions like what? Okay. Fi, fi, ala, min, ala. Okay. I don't know why, but I, I think, yeah, you have a point. More? Please. The last two lines are like a couplet of rhyme. Okay, nice to notice this. The last, the last two lines rhyme. More musical. The last two lines, probably because this is Ma'amarat in Tabi'ul Fijla fi Sahaji Tu'al Yawm, Fil Qudsi Dabba Jumbul Mutarim Fawq Al Ghaim, possibly. But they're not the same, like the same, is it the same? No, this is a little bit different. We will come to this. Okay? 
Not always. This is small, this is long, small, long. It varies. It's shapeless. The second part is formless. Probably this is blank or free verse. And then we come to the conclusion here, to the question. Why is the poet using two different forms of poetry in the same poem? Why does the poet shift, why does the meme here, or the speaker, shift from a highly regular, highly structured, well-organized form of poetry to a shapeless, formless kind of of poetry. Is there, a, is there a reason? And again, don't say, don't ask uh, whether Tamim or the poet meant it or not. The text. We deal with the text. I'm not sure how you reacted when you, when you first heard this poem or read this poem. Did you feel that there was a, a jump, an abrupt sh shift? When it's read, no? Mm. Personally, when I first heard the poem online, uh, Amir Shuara, I was like, oh, there was a subject, probably because I'm specialized in poetry. I felt it instantly. I was like, there is a reason here. Why is he shifting? What's going on in the first stanza that we don't have in the second stanza or vice versa? Please. Yeah. Yeah, but this is not a poetic answer. I know at school you used to say, uh, to attract the attention of, the, of the, the reader, to emphasize these two things mean nothing. Because the question is, why, why? why? again? And how? We just mentioned the how. But if you say, to attract the attention of the reader, this is not a poetic uh, answer. This is not a critical answer. This is a school answer. To emphasize the idea. Where is the emphasis? And what's the idea? This is what we do at university. So yeah, the repetition, you could say here, yeah, the repetition of Al-Quds, al quds al quds to emphasize the idea. What idea? See my point? We usually give, we, we are here to learn, to learn how to be as poetic as possible. Please. Maybe it refers to Jerusalem itself. Say, say again. It refers to Jerusalem What? Uh, the first stanza, it was highly organized as Jerusalem was before the Israeli program. Mm, nice. That, that's beautiful. More, please. I'm not really sure how to express myself, but I tried. At the, at the, the first sense that he was describing the quotes from outside where there's the walls and, so, and the, he reflected the walls with the rigid form. And in the second sense, when he went inside the uh, quotes and its small alleys and the uh, harad, and so he used the, the blank verse. So what's, what's happening from the outside? What can you see from the inside? And what is there inside that makes it change shape and form? Please. We don't say Jews. It's not about Jews. Israel. Uh, the Zionists say that uh, Jerusalem is to them, not okay. for us. So he used first the physical way to say that Jerusalem is ours. Uh, but the, the second, uh, and it's just, it is still ours. Okay. So you're connecting here the old form with what used to be. How Jerusalem is ours. The Bringing the past with the with the uh, present. Yeah, Thank you. Okay. Ah, oh, nice. Okay, I like this point. So, point number one: the first part is the expectation that Jerusalem, in our mind and heart, in our imagination, the city that that we as Palestinians can't have, can't even visit. So we have this 
beautiful, poetic, perfect image of Jerusalem. And that's why, that's how it is from afar, from a distance. But once inside, things are totally different. Please. What, what makes it unbearable here in the first part? Why is it that you can't endure things you see in Jerusalem? He's expecting to see the chaos inside. But he knows there is, uh, he, sense that, he senses that there's this. But it's the enemies, the enemy occupiers that is making it probably unimaginably horrible, humiliating. So the first part here, is organized, like some of you are suggesting, because this could reflect the, some kind of expectations. Yes, he knows, everybody knows that. I'm sure even the poet, in, the, in his imagination, is, uh, it, it cannot deny the fact that Jerusalem is occupied. It's controlled by, by enemies. I was discussing this with a friend yesterday, and it's, so it's her idea. She said that... Who's that? Sally. OK. Okay, this is some kind of insistence. Now, this is ours, and we have the shape that we can make Jerusalem fit in, or I don't know, like, like insisting that these, this is, uh, <coughs> Jerusalem is ours as much as these poetic uh, t traditions of the Arabs are ours, yes. belong to us. More. So you're saying the change here is, is because Tamim wants to be different from, to shift from the Arab traditions of writing poetry? Yeah, exactly. Why? So, uh, what's, what's happening in the second stanza that makes him shift? That's the question. He goes inside the city. He goes what? inside and starts seeing everything. What's going on inside Jerusalem? An Who enemy. is there? Okay, if, if, if this is a story, who are the characters in the second part of the poem? Someone from Georgia, someone from Abba Manhattan, someone from Bologna, whatever this is, someone from, uh, what's that? The, uh, Ethiopia, possibly around Ethiopia, and someone from France or the UK or Brazil or Canada or Australia. The only person, the only Arab person, and then also the blonde tourists coming to Jerusalem. The only person here is this poor, nameless, faceless woman doing stupid thing. Sorry, no, there's no, no business, no work is stupid work, but she's selling this uh, turnip kind of thing, and fidget. It's not sage or thyme or olive oil or olive oil or something. So in the second stanza, what I'm saying here is that while the expectations, the meme, or like all of our expectations, <laughs> when, when, have you ever been to Jerusalem? I asked this maybe before. How, how many of you? Like, like three or oh, that's very few again. So the point is when you go there, for whatever reason, you have these great expectations like, wow, the beautiful, the ancient city, our eternal capital. But once you are there, and we know that there is the Israeli occupation all the time controlling it. But again, the expectations are high. When you go there, what do you do in Jerusalem, basically? Of course, you could go uh, eat uh, kayak or whatever, first and foremost. But we go to pray, thank you, to worship. Because the spirituality of Jerusalem, the place itself has this sacred aura about it, spirituality. By the way, if you Google Jerusalem syndrome, there's this crazy thing that people believe in that if you go to Jerusalem you kind of lose it sometimes some people lose it because of I don't know why so you go you pray yes you take pictures and you take pictures with the Dome of the Rock with the you know there's the famous stairs there 
the scenery, the old places, the souks, the old streets and alleys. You don't go take pictures with stupid fidgel here. And I love how Tamim is using fidgel. Because those uh, uh, tourists, those enemy uh, occupiers, those intruders, do not understand the nature of the city. The traditions here, the heritage is that as Palestinians, Zatar, Rehan, Mumkin, Na'na, right? Mint, Sage, Time. These are identity is things, issues. Like Fijil, you could live for two, three years without eating Fijil. But those people say, like, wow, let's take a picture with this woman selling this kind of grenade kind of thing. So I'm, 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 I'm suggesting is that, and look at this man, what, he, what is he doing? He came all the way from Georgia to fight with, with his wife here. I think we have had enough fights with our wives. We don't want more people, more, more negativity. Planning to do what in Jerusalem? This is unfathomable. To me, this is unfathomable. Many people will say, like, if I am in Jerusalem, if I were in Jerusalem, I would be just, I don't know, resisting all the time, probably praying all the time. The spirituality here it comes, comes first. And then the old man coming all the way from Upper Manhattan, teaching people who came all the way from this place. And look at this guy from Africa, closing. Jerusalem should not be closed. No place of worship should be closed or controlled this way. And look at that gun, the machine gun. Remember that uh, there's that, the other poem, Jaddatun Abgul, Mujannatun Indaha Tisatani min al min al She she isn't uh, uh, 18 years old. She is nine years old and nine years old. This is how small and little she is, young she is. This man. The, the machine gun is on this settler because compared to the gun, the gun is even bigger than himself. Look at this. Not even someone like deliberate because we've seen like, see, we've seen Christian Zionists familiar with this concept. Christian Zionists, Christians who believe that the Jews have to convert to Christianity at the end of the day. They love Israel, not because they love Israel, but because they hate Israel. <laughs> because they, they believe that at the end of the day, all Jews should come to, to, to Palestine, to Jerusalem, to Palestine, so they can convert to Christianity. And the people around Trump are some of them. So those people, and even some, I don't know, some Jewish Zionists from the end of the world, they come here, they don't just come for the spirituality of Jerusalem, they just I know, I, I believe that some of them are religious people and they believe in this. But others just like, they want to show off, they want to take the picture. And many, many times they come here on free tours. The birth, birthright uh, paid. If I tell any one of you, okay, let's go on a paid tour, you just pay nothing. Two months, one month, you go anywhere around the world. Many of you would be willing to say, okay, I'm in. But be careful because sometimes you will be like destroying others like those uh, Zionists are, are doing. And again, the blonde uh, foreigners coming here just they don't see Jerusalem. And that's why uh, Tamim says somewhere they don't see Jerusalem because there are two Jerusalems. The Jerusalem that is ours, it belongs to the Arabs, whether Christians or Muslims, by the way. Because he will be emphasizing, and this is a feature of Palestinian poetry about Jerusalem. I've noticed this all the time. If a Palestinian poet writes about Jerusalem, there are always Christians and there are always Muslims. There's always the church, there's always uh, the mosque, there's always the Bible, and there's always the, the Quran there. Because Jerusalem unites us, brings us together. But it's the Israeli enemy occupier that is destroying the very fabric of Jerusalem. That is turning this well-structured, beautiful place that, is sub that should be beautiful, should be as we imagine it, a place for all that unites. The existence of those outsiders is destroying 
the structure of the poem as much as it is destroying the structure of the very essence of our lives, Palestinians. Okay? Before I move to the second question, you want to say something? Huh? Uh, I was going to say something about the pattern. Why I think you changed. Uh, well, in the first stanza, basically he's not describing anything. He's just stating ideas and, and thoughts. And in the other stanza, we, we find description. So what I think happens is that um, if he used the classical style, the description of the, the modern view would seem like an archaic picture. So he shifted to a more modern way of description in order to give us a sense that this is the present day. To not make the... A the sense that is chaotic and messy. Mm -hmm. No, like, if we use the classical style of description and using the same way, maybe the, the picture will seem like... Are, are you suggesting oh, no, that no, no, no. are you suggesting that Arabic uh, poetry, classical Arabic poetry, is incapable of describing this no, in this it way? Is oh. like, just a way of change. Okay, so this is going back to attracting the attention of of the, of the readers. And this, okay, classical Arabic poetry is capable of describing modern pictures, but if we're going to describe something that's going on, something chaotic, as you said, it, I think he, he did the right thing by using... By taking out the structure? Yeah, taking out the structure. So, and again, this is what some of you already suggested, that the, the fact that he, uh, the second sense is dominated by outsiders invading uh, intruders, the, the, the Zionist occupation, the enemy occupier, destroys the very shape and form and fabric and structure of the poem. But other than this, if you look at the first poem, some of you suggested that here we have the past, present, and future. I think Tamim is also trying to connect this the Ch 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 Jerusalem with our past, our future, and our, our, our present. The fact that he's using this, again, Arabic tradition, traditional form, he's basically connecting, I think, connecting Jerusalem with our identity as Arabs. Again, with the Muslims or Christians. And again, Maybe he's saying, he's implying that if we want to have Jerusalem back, we have to go back to our roots. Arabs have never been united. But in the past, we were a lot better than now. Because today, we're not only facing, uh, fighting against uh, the Israeli enemy occupier, we're also fighting against, because you know, sometimes we are hurt more by ourselves and by Arabs around us, the Arab regimes. Sadly, normalization with the, with the, with, with the occupier. So this could be an indication that, an indication that we need to go back to our roots. We need to go back to our past, to our origins as Arabs, in order to have Jerusalem back. And that's why probably basically the past simple, the present simple, and the future simple tense, uh, tenses are, are used here. And I, I want to, to go back to the, the, the dialogue here. Yes, there is a dialogue in the first stanza, although it's a dialogue made up between an internal dialogue. Monologue, what's a monologue? Between yourself. So you and yourself, it's basically some kind of dialogue also. Okay? But here, look, look. we lose the dialogue. We lose the dialogue. This is a monologue now, monologic. It's one way. There's one image, sorry, there's one world view here dominated by the occupation, the occupiers. Can I say something about the shape? There is uh, one world view in the second part. One party dominating everything. Even when Arabs are, marg are mentioned, they are only on the margin. A street vendor selling something exotic. Not that I'm suggesting that Fijil is exotic, but something that would attract the, 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 the tourists. Like, wow, what is this woman selling? Let's take pictures with her. Suggesting that for them, this Fijil is probably more precious, more attractive than Jerusalem herself. Let, let me say instead of itself. One more thing. Please. I just want to say that it seems that he's nostalgic. Like, 
nostalgic to uh, what's happening like in the past. Because like in the first stanza, he's saying that uh, yeah. And the second thing, he starts uh, describing what you see when you visit it. So I think that there is nostalgia. nostalgia. There's a sense of nostalgia. And the first is kind of he, he is the restricted uh, with many English grammars, like crime and Cesara and many English like grammars. Mm. And the second is that he uh -huh. writes three verses. As if he need to reach a message to the Israeli population, we need to be free, not the not the land. That's also that's also one way of putting it. A freeing. We need this kind of freedom. But we don't have it. Someone else, an outsider, does. Okay, thank you very much. I'll jump, just give me two minutes so we finish this class. I'll jump uh, to this last image very quickly. And look at how beautiful the imagery in Tamim is. I think he's unmatchable in many ways. Yeah? And Nawafid the windows. You know, the windows on top. What are the windows doing? They're holding. This is a personification. You know, person, personify, personification, tashkhis, to talk about something as if it's a human being. Holding what? Somebody's hand. That's a metaphor, a personification. But whose hand is this? The hand of the morning. So this motherly window here is holding the hand of the baby-like morning at birth because the day is, you know, is still young. This is a double metaphor, uniquely done, masterfully done by, by Tamim. I'm second bi sabah. Turihi kaifa naqshu bil alwan, because in 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 Palestinian ancient mosques and churches, there's the mosaic, you know, windows with yellow and blue and green and very colorful mosaic so the windows are saying because the day the daylight is colorless right yes. it's colorless so it's like you know you go to your grandma and she looks at you look at you all thin and she keeps stuffing you with food and it's like what you colorless here if you come here to me this is how you become colorful. You pass by me from one side, outside, to the inside, and then it's all colorful. But this is still a kid, a baby day. And again, this is another dialogue here. But this is not the dialogue that ends with, you know, a lot of bloodshed. If the day wants to stay outside the window, you're free, you do whatever you want, you be the way you like. But if you get inside the mosque, under the dome, through the window, And I love the word nawafid again here. Here it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean windows. Nawafid al-Rahman here means the orders, the commands, the will, and the wishes of God. And this is in English called a pun, a word with two meanings, <coughs> playing on this thing. Look at the imagery, look at how concrete this is. Some of the most beautiful poetry ever. I'll stop here, my question for, for you, other than again trying to connect the, the reason why Tamim is shifting from a well-structured uh, uh, stanza at the, in the opening to a, a, a formless uh, stanza, what are the features of Palestinian literature as seen in Tamim's poem? Listen, if some of you are interested in doing research paper, optional, I'm not saying this is part of the uh, class assessment. If some of you are interested in doing a research paper, come to me. We can talk about these things. We can 
examine dialogism in, 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 in Tamim. We can examine how uh, Christians and Muslims always come together. We talk about features of Palestinian uh, uh, poetry and literature. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. If you have a question, please ask. And for next class, we're, we're going to do an English uh, uh, poem from the 16th century, Who Saw List to Hunt? Article